Hello, and welcome to our DDF Airways Flight 815. I'm Cassie, and along with Chris, Brennan, and Royal, it will be our pleasure to serve you today. We'll be traveling at an altitude of 5 feet. Our in-flight movie will be Airplane, written by Zucker, Zucker, and Abraham. I'll be playing Elaine, the flight attendant, and ground control. I'll be playing co-pilot Roger Murdoch, Dr. Rumack, and flight trainer Rex Kramer. And I'll be playing former Air Force pilot Ted Stryker and navigator Victor Boston. And I'll be playing Captain Clarence Over and airport manager Steve McCroskey, and everyone else who gets hurt or dies. We realize you have a wide <laughs> choice of reader theater providers, and thank you for choosing DDF Airways. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. <laughs> Flight 209 are cleared for takeoff. Roger. What? LA departure frequency 2.9 er. Roger. Huh? Request vector over. <laughs> what? Flight 209 are cleared for vector 324. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger, what's our vector, Victor? Tower so radio clearance over. <laughs> That's Clarence over. Over. <laughs> Roger. Huh? Roger, over. What? Huh? <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Are you a doctor? <laughs> Wrong part. Ted, what are you doing on this flight? <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, I, I've, I've got to talk to you. You shouldn't have come. I don't have time for <coughs> I, I promise you, I can really change. Why don't you take that job that Louis Nets offered you in Boeing? You know I haven't been able to get near an airplane since the war. And even if I could, they wouldn't hire me because of my record. Your war record? You're the only one that's keeping that alive! I tell you the most of your record since the war! Different cities! Different jobs! <laughs> it shows that you can't accept any real responsibility! been right for a long time, but it'll be different, like it was in the beginning, remember? All I have are the memories. Feeling. Oh, so I remember the nights we were together. I remember how the we got it, how the sun came up. When it did, it was, it was almost like, like you two do. That, that's the way I've always wanted it to be, Elaine. But it won't be. Not as long as you insist on living in the past. Q flashback. Ted, Dr. Stanley says you'll be out in a week. Isn't that good news? Is it? Because of my mistake, six men didn't come back from that raid. Seven. Lieutenant Zip died this morning. You'll <laughs> 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 be out in a week. Um, but they claim you have any blame for what happened on that raid. Isn't that good news? Is it? Because of my mistake. Uh, six men died in that raid. I, I just wish I could. Just wish George Zip was here today. Be patient, Ted. No one expects you to get up with us immediately. Just remember the plans you made before the war. A lot of people made plans before the war, like George Zip. <laughs> <laughs> sir, excuse me, sir. Are you a doctor? That's right. We have some passengers on board who are very sick. Could you come and take a look at them? Yes, of course. Pain there? Uh-huh. Yes, I see. <laughs> Do you see your tongue? I was afraid of that. I'll be back in a minute. You better tell the captain I must speak with him. This man has got to be taken to a hospital. A hospital? What is it? It's a big building with patients, but that's not important right now. <laughs> tell the captain I must speak with him. Captain, how soon can we land? I can't tell. You can tell me. I'm a doctor. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just not sure. Can't you take a guess? Well, not for another two you hours. You can't take a guess for another two hours? <laughs> no, I mean, we can't land for another two hours. Fog is closed on everything on this side of the mountains, and we have to go through to Chicago. We have two more sick people, the rest of the passengers are really worried. <laughs> Find out what the two sick people had for dinner. Dr. Sandler, the two sick people had fish for dinner. All right. Now we know what we're up against. The people on this plane who ate fish for dinner will become violently ill within the next half hour. Just how serious is it, Doctor? Extremely serious. It starts with a slight fever, then a dryness in the throat. The victim becomes dizzy and begins to experience a rash and itching. From there, the poison works its way into the central nervous system, causing severe muscle spasms. By drooling. At this point, the entire digestive system is rendered useless, causing the complete collapse of the lower bowels of the at this point, the poor bugger is used to a quivering, wasted piece of jelly. Uh, Turn up on the autopilot! Uh, on my foot! On my foot! Oh, is, this is Elaine Dickinson. I am the stewardess. Captain Over has passed out on the floor. We've lost the co-pilot the navigator, too. We're in terrible trouble. Over. Elaine, Roger Ryder, I read you. This is Steve McCroskey at Chicago Air Control. Now, listen carefully. Is the automatic pilot on? Over. Uh, yes it is. Over. Very good. Now, Elaine, where are you? Over. I'm standing over, over, over. <laughs> Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. 
I want the best man available on this. A man who knows that playing inside and out. And a man who won't crack under pressure. Get me Rex Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your steward speaking. We regret any inconveniences that <coughs> the movement may have caused, and we hope you enjoyed the rest of your flight. By the way, is there anyone aboard who knows how to fly a plane? Oh, oh God! God! <laughs> what? Excuse me, sir, there's been a little problem in the cockpit. The cockpit? What is it? It's the little room at the front uh, of the plane where the pilots sit, but that's not important right now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, sir, do you know anything about planes? Well, I flew during the war, but that was a long time ago. Wouldn't know anything about it now. Look, sir, can you fly this plane and land it? Surely, you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. <laughs> well, I flew single-engine fighters in the Air Force, but I haven't touched any kind of plane in six years. Mr. Stryker, all I know is this. You're the only person on this plane who can possibly fly it. You're the only chance we've got. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Kramer, one of the passengers is going to land the plane. His name is Ted Stryker. Stryker? I flew him during the war. Ted Stryker was a correct flight leader up to a point. But it went all to pieces on one particular mission. Let's just hope that doesn't happen again tonight, but my gut feeling is that when the going gets rough upstairs, Ted Stryker's gonna fold up. Look, Rex, I want you to get on the horn and talk this guy down. You've gotta talk him right down to the ground. You can use that radio over there. <sighs> Looks like I picked up long a week to quit drinking. Stryker! Stryker, this is Captain Rex Kramer speaking. Yes, Captain Kramer. Read you loud. All right, it's obvious you remember me. If you do what I tell you to do, when I tell you to do it, there's no reason you can't bring that plane in. Let's not kid each other here, Kramer. You know I've never flown a bucket like this. We need all the luck there is. Stand by, Stryker. The one hope I have is to build this man up. I've got to give him all the confidence I can. All right, Stryker. Have you ever flown a multi-engine plane before? Never. Ah, oh, crap! This is a total waste of time. Just, just <laughs> rat him into Lake Michigan at least avoid killing innocent people on the ground. <laughs> you idiot, you've got the mic on. Grab a hold of yourself. You've got to talk him down. You're the only chance they've got. <laughs> All right, Stryker. Now you listen to me and you listen close. Flying is no different than riding a bicycle. It just happens to be a lot harder to put baseball cards in the spokes. Now, since there's someone there who can work the radio and leave you free for flying, the stewardess is here with me. All right, Stryker. What kind of weather are you in up there? Rain. Rain. How's it handling? Sluggish, like a wet sponge. Sluggish, like a wet sponge. All right, Stryker, you're doing just fine. It's a damn good thing he doesn't know how much I hate his guts. It's a damn good thing you don't know how much he hates your guts. <laughs> 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 Wrong week to quit amphetamines. <laughs> how are the passengers doing? I want to see you, Mr. Stryker. We're running out of time. Well, surely there must be something you can do. I'm doing everything I can. Stop calling me Shirley. Stryker, that plane can't land itself. It takes the pilot to handle pressure. That's right, I can't take the pressure. I was crazy to think I could land a plane. Oh, but, Ted, you're the only one. Oh, I don't care. I just don't have what it takes. <coughs> I know what you're going to say, so save your breath. No, look, you've done the best you could. I, I want to tell you something. I was in the war myself, the medical corps. I was on duty late one night when a badly wounded pilot was brought in from a raid. He said, Doc. The odds were against us up there, but we went in anyway, and I'm glad we did. The captain made the right decision. That pilot's name was George Zip. George Zip said that? Well, excuse me, Doc. I've got a plane to land. Listen to Cr me, Kramer. We got sick people up here in critical condition. We've got to land now. Don't be a fool, Stryker. I'm ordering you to stay up there. No dice, Chicago, and I'm giving the orders. Guess the foot's on the other hand now, isn't it, Kramer? You can't come straight in. You've got to stay up there until we get a break in the weather. Now listen here, Kramer. I'm coming in. You hear me? We got people up here who'll die in less than an hour. Now I haven't made your precious airplane, but I'll get it down. Now get on with the landing check. Yes? I just, I wanted you to know. No. Tell them the gear is down and that we're ready to land. The gear is down and we're ready to land. He may not be able to fly, but he sure got guts. Stryker, what's your altitude? I don't know. How high is the 89th floor of the John Hancock building? What? All right. Now just listen carefully. You should be able to see the runway at 300 feet. It sure is quiet out there. Yeah. Too quiet. <laughs> Looks like I've the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Look, there he is! <laughs> yes. Striker, you're coming too fast! I know, I know! He knows, he knows! Oh, wow! He knows me, 125, 130! Bring it down, easy! <laughs> Look at all those buttons! <laughs> that was beautiful! Just beautiful! You're coming in too hot! Remember your brakes and switches! You're coming in too fast! He's coming right at us! Put down full flaps. Watch your nose. Lift the nose. Roll back. Hold her steady. Hold her steady. Pow! Boom! Striker? Striker, are you alright? Yeah. Ted, that was probably the lousiest landing in the history of this airport. But there's some of us down here, particularly me, who'd like to buy you a drink and, and shake your hand. And Ted, I just want to let you know that when they go and get rough upstairs, when the chips were down, loneliness. That's the bottom line, Ted. I was, I was never happy as a child. <laughs> Christmas, Ted, what did, what did it mean to you? For me, it was a living hell. Do you know what it's like to fall down in the mud and get kicked in the head? By an iron boot? <laughs> of course you don't, Ted. <laughs> no one does. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your wonderful audience participation. Let's give another round of applause for our DBS.